she all the hands. Uh, Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank Very much so. You, you're, you're honoring us with your presence. And, uh, uh, the Honorable Brenda Murphy, I want to tell you a little bit of uh, some background information. And she's, uh, she is the 32nd Lieutenant Governor, and she was uh, installed in the end of uh, 2019. She was a former executive director of the St. John Women's Entrepreneurial Network and an organization she led for more than uh, 20 years. So obviously the commitment to ending poverty and family violence uh, uh, and as well, obviously she's very committed to advancing women's equality. Uh, she was nominated as a member of the Gender Equality uh, network, a Canadian network, and uh, made up of diverse women ladies throughout the country. She was also a member of the National Advisory Council on Poverty and the uh, New Brunswick Advisory Council on the Status of Women. She served uh, many terms as a municipal councillor, and she's volunteered on a variety of uh, organizations and uh, and the Economic and Social Inclusion Corporation of New Brunswick. I do understand that Her Honor wishes to address a few words to all of us. Sure, thank you, Claire. Oh, and you're welcome. Thanks for including me on this and, and also inviting me to be your patron. I'm, uh, I'm very excited to, uh, to do so and honored and I'm looking forward to to meeting you folks um, in, a, in a different way, not a virtual face-to-face, -face, but hopefully at some point um, in person, face-to-face. -face. Uh, this is unbelievable in some ways, but this is my first Zoom meeting. I've used several other platforms, but this is my first one, so it's kind of cool, and I'm actually uh, happy that it's worked without any glitches, it seems, so far. Um, <laughs> Also, uh, I've you know looked at your website and and uh, I guess you you mentioned that I worked with the Women's Empowerment Network. I noticed your your mission that talks about empowering women to know about their their health choices and so on. So that obviously really resonates with me and and also trying to help women stay connected. And that was again something that our organization did in, try, in terms of. Um, helping women to increase their social network because, you know, understanding that that, that is then um, can be helpful to, to all of us um, when we have those connections to community and, and resources. So uh, I'm looking forward to learning more um, about the Breast and Women's Cancer Partnership. I have to read that because it's not stuck in my mind yet, but it will be. I think you <laughs> say the letters NBBWCP, so I have to get used to that. Um, but I'm looking forward to learning more about the work and I'm really, um, really interested too in your, in your Zoom sessions. Looking forward to what Rachel has to say today and and I'm also going to sit in on Thursday. It's the same topic, but um, many of you may know I, I am trying to learn French. And so on Thursday, I'm hoping because I've heard Rachel in English, that when I sit in on, uh, on Thursday, I'll pick up a lot more and that'll just, uh, that'll help me as I continue to, um, to learn a new language. And it seems to be going well, I, I hope anyway. So today's topic, I think, is a really good one, particularly now. I mean, it's, a, it's an important topic at the best of times, but uh, in these days, it's, it's a good one. So I'm looking forward to it and just, again, want to say thank you so much for including me. Oh, my gosh, the, all the pleasure is ours. Uh, again, many thanks and, uh, and, you, and, and uh, equally which is very important to us and means a lot to us as well, is your acceptance to serve as the, an honorary uh, patron to our organization. And our organization is made up of a lot of women in New Brunswick because cancer incidence uh, does not, uh, does not uh, well, 
we're hoping it will decrease and we're hoping to be able to work around it and to build up that capacity, but a capacity for information and support as well. And we'll be honored to share uh, more insight into what the organization is all about and what it would like to be about. And, uh, and it's all about building supportive lines throughout the province. Uh, uh, again, most sincere thank you and uh, and uh, look forward to brighter futures for all the women in New Brunswick, the families and the communities because they are linked equally well with the with the, the capacity to uh, uh, be able to build uh, communities of support, of solidarity, of of uh, understanding and compassion. Now, with all of that said, uh, Rachel, I, I, I'm honest with you. Where is she? She moved again. There she is. Uh, uh, I, need, I need some tips and tricks to manage all my emotions right now. This is, this is, this is awesome. You know, when we first started talking about Zoom talks, we, but they're, they're coming true and they're, they're connecting with people and the, the, the number of people and the, from different walks of life and ways of life and we all have something to offer is, is uh, it's, anyway. With all of that said, and I need to bounce back. We all need to bounce back. So let's bounce together, Rachel. Would you do that for us? Well, I don't know if I can do it for you, but I can certainly give you tips on how to do it. <laughs> we can that sounds great. So I'm going to share the, my screen to start with. Whoops. Uh, let me see. Uh, there. There you go. Oh. And um, I want you to notice that I've gone wild with spring colors. I decided that although it was snowing in Ottawa this week, I wasn't taking any of it. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, before I get into the, um, in fact, the, the the topic per se, uh, I want to thank you for inviting me. It's always really a true pleasure to connect with the uh, the organization, and it's not my first time with you. And uh, I always really, really look forward to it. I admire what you do. Um, and again, if I can support you in any way I can, always feel free to, uh, to count, to call on me. Uh, you're really a fantastic group. Thank and you. Um, the other thing I wanted to uh, mention is that when I started preparing this um, presentation, obviously the theme is resilience. And um, what I did actually, I went back in the scientific literature and I looked at what COVID-19 um, does to us, which areas of our lives are most at risk uh, in terms of resilience. So what I did is really to sum up um, a lot of the recent literature and, um, and boil it down into some tips on how to really, um, really maintain our psychological health and uh, bounce back if need be. So the, um, whoops, oh, let me see, I'll try this, that will go better. And so today's goal, in fact, it's really to give us the basics to get rolling again. So uh, maybe we feel a bit uh, deflated and uh, so we'll kind of um, do what we need to do in order to uh, get back on track. And um, I really like the title because to me, it really fits well with the definition of resilience because resilience is all about bouncing back. And it's a definition that most people have heard, but it's not, curiously enough, the most common definition. And we're going to take a closer look at some of the definitions out there and what happens if we don't choose the right one. Um, the most common definition that we find 
in the um, older literature. And it's really what I see now also in the healthcare system. Um, with the COVID crisis, I'm um, working with a lot of um, healthcare organizations to set up peer support programs. And what really, really strikes me, um, and it's been the case for the past two months, is that a lot of healthcare workers actually work from the first definition I'm about to show you. And so their starting point is to believe that resilience uh, res resilience means to be able to take it in no matter what. And um, it means that, you know, you know, trauma after trauma, I mean, rough day after rough day, their way of looking at it is just, I've got to resist and just absorb what's happening to me. And when they do that, what we see is that um, when they get shaken by events, and just this morning, I was in fact um, accompanying someone on the front lines um, who was overwhelmed with the number of dead in the long-term care facility where she works. And she always believed that she could resist to whatever came her way. And this morning she collapsed. And so she was doubly shaken up. She was shaken because she never expected to collapse. And also she lost the um, kind of identity she had developed. She so believed that being resilient meant never faltering, that there was a real sense of uh, being lost. And in her, in the conversation, I could see that because suddenly she wasn't, you know, the rock of Gibraltar, suddenly she didn't know what to do and how to move forward. And if she doesn't change her definition of resilience, her recovery will be compromised. The people who truly bounce back are the people who understand that resilience is a really dynamic state that entails some destabilizing. The people who bounce back are the people who know that they will have to bounce back, that bounce back is part of the whole equation. So when they get destabilized by some, um, some event, some uh, bad news, they look at the whole situation as something perfectly normal and they look at the fact that they feel overwhelmed also as something normal. And so they can stand back much better and they look at the whole situation as something temporary. They say, okay, right now, I'm really shaky, but it's a normal reaction given what's happening to me. And I know that it's just something temporary. And so when they approach it like that, they manage, instead of panicking or collapsing, they start thinking, hmm, what kind of resources could I mo mobilize? Inner or outer resources, either uh, do something that will really be good to, to myself or seek out some help to just help myself get a bit steadier. And then once they've managed to steady themselves, they manage to bounce back, to recover, to be resilient. But what really defined the process at the very beginning is the kind of definition we're going to choose. And it really leads us to um, an important recognition that resilience is not at all about invincibility, but it's about the capacity to bounce back after hardship. And there's a, um, a really interesting resilience paradox. And it's that acknowledge, acknowledging our vulnerability is our greatest strength. And when you stop to think about it, you realize that if you don't know where the chinks in the armor are located, you won't know how to protect yourself. If you know where your vulnerabilities are, then you will know how to shield yourself properly, how to compensate properly. And because you know you're vulnerable, you can be proactive and in the end, protect yourself a whole lot better than someone who claims to be um, 
invulnerable, invulnerable. So when we study resilience, the best possible starting point is to embrace where we're at without judgment. If we've had some bad news, if we, we've had, if we've gone through some rough patches, the best strategy is just to say, I've had a real hard time. I'm not going to knock myself over the head with this whole thing. I'm just going to embrace what is and really acknowledge that my reactions are normal and I will give myself some space. And in my work with the COVID teams on the ground, that's what we're trying to implement to make sure that people are capable of just stepping back a few times a day, giving themselves some space and never, never blame themselves for their reactions because under great pressures, it's very normal to feel destabilized. So the, um, what are the challenges when we look at what we're going, we are going through now with isolation and social distancing? There are going to be, in fact, three types of challenges. Physical challenges, I mean, in terms of body, we have to deal with the impacts of our physical inactivity, our tendency to overeat, because now we're always next to the fridge, so very tempting, and anxiety also interferes with sleep. So physically, uh, we've got three uh, dangers kind of lurking in the dark that we need to address. For the mind, um, what new publications tell us is that we're so much on the computer nowadays that we see a radical shortening of the attention span and that we're losing our creativity because we've moved into a very passive mode, just receiving, looking at screens and receiving, and somehow our creativity has fallen by the wayside. So we have to look at ways to kind of boost it again. And for the heart, um, what we notice is that clearly most people have a shorter fuse, fuse so emotions are, um, you know, the sensitivity is really heightened. Um, we are all dealing with disrupted routines and we're aware that there's a lot of suffering in the world and we experience also an increasing sense of isolation. So the key, the best strategies for us to bounce back would be to tackle strategies at the three levels. So what are the best um, strategies to use? For the body, it's always the same three paths that seem to be the, the best, to exercise, to eat well, and to sleep well. And if you have the ch a choice amongst the three, the main thing for resilience is protecting one's sleep. Sleep, in fact, is the main engine in terms of physical and psychological well-being because pretty much everything rests on um, the quality and the quantity of our sleep. And we all know that if we don't sleep well, we do have a shorter fuse in the morning. We get more impatient. We have more difficulty thinking. But even physically, if we don't sleep well, we disrupt the whole of our hormonal balance. And it has huge impacts on all the body systems. So the first thing to really protect is sleep. And it means sleeping about eight hours per day. I know it sounds quite a bit for most people, but that's the, uh, what neuroscience tells us now, that we need about eight hours a day and uh, that we have to be very cautious about our caffeine and alcohol intake. Um, alcohol at night will actually interfere with good sleep and caffeine's got a half-life of seven hours. That means that if I drink a nice cup of coffee at three o'clock in the afternoon, 
by 10 o'clock at night, I still have 50% of the caffeine in my bloodstream. So if we want to sleep well, preferably no alcohol at night and no coffee after uh, noon. And I don't have to get into all the details, but something that um, puts us in jeopardy physically in that period of COVID, because again, we do next to no physical activity, is a phenomenon called metabolic slowdown. Metabolic slowdown, in fact, is our body's uh, tendency to go into energy conservation. If we don't exercise just small bits here and there, not necessarily much, just climbing a few stairs every couple of hours, uh, walking around the block, again, nothing strenuous. But if we don't move pretty much every second hour, our body goes into energy conservation mode and it's really bad for us. All our systems tend to shut down and we will feel lousy both physically and psychologically. And another way to counteract the metabolic slowdown is the, uh, to do intermittent fasting. I don't have time to go into it today, but I highly recommend that you go read about intermittent fasting. So that would help us take part, care of the body side of things. For the mind, to protect our attention and creativity, what we uh, could try would be to avoid using electronics when we take breaks during the day. And it's fascinating, the papers coming down the pipeline since COVID hit is that people now entertain themselves a whole lot more on the computer than they did before. And so it robs people of the healthy activities in their lives. Activities like connecting with friends. And when I, I speak about being on the computer, um, Zooms are fine, Skypes are fine. Activities that connect us to people are just fine. But if we fall into the trap of just watching videos, doing video games, and ending up with mostly a virtual world devoid of true human connections, it's going to be really bad for us. So when we want to take a break from the screen, um, it's important to do, um, to practice some mindfulness in between our screen time to come back and be able to connect with the body and feel literally how we are physically and psychologically and really vary our occupations in favor of the meaningful ones. Um, so maybe doing, trying new recipes, um, playing a musical instrument, um, maybe now starting to do some gardening, but really trying to do stuff that feeds the soul away from screens. And for our emotions, for the heart, what would be good? I was mentioning that we all go through more heightened emotional sensitivity. We've got our disrupted routines and we've got again that sense of pervasive suffering um, and an increasing sense of isolation. So what can we do about that? So with the heightened emotions, what we tend to do, and again, it's normal, it's just human nature, when we feel something unpleasant, our normal reaction is avoidance. I don't like this, so I'm going to stick my head in the sand. And it's a perfectly normal reaction, but it doesn't help us to uh, really regulate emotions. If we ignore them, um, we're, it, we're really going to do a disservice to ourselves in the long term. And so we really need to acknowledge that emotions are a little bit like sensations. Let's say it's really, really cold. 
and I start shivering. Um, sometimes people would say, well, shivering is really bad. In fact, no. Shivering is very unpleasant, but shivering isn't bad because shivering helps me to regulate my internal temperature. So shivering plays a very important role in my life. It tells me I'm cold, it helps regulate my internal temperature, and it tells me go get a coat. And so unpleasant sensations are not useless. In fact, they are very useful. And it's the same thing for emotions. Unpleasant emotions are that unpleasant, but they are very useful because they carry a message I need to hear. And that's why when we, uh, we are in times of crisis, we know that unpleasant emotions really multiply and that our tendency to avoid them also increases. I mean, we see all this coming down the pipeline and we just want to run for cover. But we have to really um, take hold of ourselves and really counter our initial reaction. Instead of running away, we have to stop, pay attention so that we can understand the emotions, understand their message, and then regulate them, manage them. So what's the, um, the best strategy to manage emotions? There are several protocols, but in the short time we have, I've chosen one of the uh, shorter ones. The first step is to recognize what's going on. And as you will see, this strategy is called RAIN, and the R is for recognize what's going on. So if I feel an unpleasant tugging, um, I really have to pay attention and just look inside, stop and really ask myself, what's happening now? Um, what am I feeling? And, you know, what's, what's going on? So just stepping back and not ignoring the emotion. I don't have time to get into all the details in neuroscience, but when we ignore an emotion, um, we trigger a phenomenon in the brain that will end up entrenching that emotion in the brain in the long term. And it's, it's the reason why when we feel something, if we address it immediately, we stop that process, that process and the emotions don't get embedded in the brain to the same extent. So stopping and looking at what's going on is absolutely key. And also allow the experience to be there just as it is. Again, because it's unpleasant, we will try to distance ourselves from the emotion, but it means again that we run away from its message. And in order to be able to get to the message, I need to stay connected to the unpleasantness of the emotion. So I allow it to inhabit my body. I let it do its stuff, maybe a pounding heart, maybe sweaty palms, maybe a tightening of the heart. I allow all of this just as it is, I'm not running away. Then I start investigating it with interest in, and care. And I do it the same way um, I would do it if I looked at an interesting phenomenon, a bit like an experiment. i wondering, gee, look at what I'm feeling now. And I would say, well, yes, I really feel it, you know, in, in this part of my body. You know, my shoulders are really tense. I feel a tightening at the heart level. Um, my heart beats faster. My jaw is clenched. We take all this in and then also emotionally feeling, I'm starting to have panicky thoughts. You just observe what's going on with again, interest and care with a lot of kindness 
and compassion. And then after you've seen all this, you nurture your inner life with self-compassion. And if you can do it too, uh, what research tells us, when you're in that state where you acknowledge what is, you embrace it, you experience it, and then what, with that self-compassion, what, what you do, you breathe in all those feelings that you find unpleasant, and when you breathe out, you breathe out spaciousness. You really say, okay, I've taken all this in, now I release it and I give it a lot of spaciousness. And when you get to the last step, you can also add, I really, as I exhale, as I breathe out uh, all those bad feelings, I really give myself a lot of kindness, a lot of self-compassion. And the, um, some uh, research in neuroscience has indicated that at that stage, if I add also compassion for others, for example, if I added the, um, the thought, well, I wish that others who experience the same thing I'm experiencing now manage to really find peace and comfort. If I have that kind of thought, um, again, it actually changes my brain. In a nutshell, what it does, it activates um, all the brain sites associated with compassion and self-compassion. And these brain sites are actually intermingled with the brain sites for our own well-being. And so if I wish others well, I trigger in my brain the centers for my own well-being. And so it's a very, very quick overview of managing emotions, but it will give you the basics to handle what's coming down nowadays. For the heart, um, again, emotionally, we know that one element that's really destabilizing for human beings is the loss of routines not being able to do things the way we used to. And clearly, in the current situation, there's lots of things that we cannot do the way we used to. I just look at doing my grocery shopping in Ottawa before I just used to walk there, pick up my stuff, walk out. Now I have to wait for about an hour, an hour and a half in line until they will let me in. So uh, my life doesn't unfold the way it used to, and there's nothing I can do about that. I have no power over COVID. I have no power over the grocery store. What I have power over is my environment. And we know that when we are in a more chaotic world, what's going to help us is in fact, turning to cleaning, tidying activities. If I cannot resolve the chaos outside, I will at least resolve the chaos in my immediate environment. And again, what we know, and it's been uh, quite a surprise with recent neuroscience, we all know that if we do real vigorous physical activities, it triggers um, the um, hormone of well-being in our brain, dopamine. What we've learned is that when we put order, when we clean, when we tidy up, we also produce dopamine and it really makes us feel a whole lot more at peace. So we cannot control the chaos out there, but we can certainly create an environment that's going to be more peaceful for ourselves. And we've got again the issue of the pervasive suffering and an increasing sense of isolation because of all the constraints we are exposed to. And there are two, it's a bit like the definition of resilience I was telling you about initially. The way I'm going to look at things is going to define how I'm going to react. And it's amazing how much outlook can have a power of transformation. 
So if, let's say, I'm surrounded by people who are negative, or if I'm surrounded the way I am currently with people who are suffering, again, providing peer support, I do it with groups and I do it individually. So, for example, if um, a physician has to de-intubate someone and feels really uncomfortable about doing it, he might give me a call so we can talk it over. Or uh, just this morning, I had um, the manager of a long-term care facility. She's been at work for 28 straight days. Her dad died. Um, she asked for a day off and she was denied. So that's the kind of situation we're seeing now. And so it's important to know how to deal with that suffering, not to be swallowed up by it. So let's look at how we should do it to really keep our own well-being. So the, if I really want to go straight into distress, I will do you know, the, the red path I'm talking about here. So let's say I'm on the phone and clearly I can hear the suffering in the voice, in the tone, I can hear the people crying. This suffering resonates with me and I experience empathy and it's normal and it's good. And at that stage, what I experience and what we all experience is the thought that, well, I can understand what that person is going through because I have suffered and it brings back to me the echoes of my own suffering. And so I can have this surge of um, understanding. I can resonate with the person who's in the difficult situation. At the third step, our spontaneous reaction will be, how can I alleviate the suffering I'm now exposed to through that person? I, how can I eradicate it? And I feel responsible for that person's suffering. I literally move it onto my shoulders. I just want to resolve it. So what happens is that I have observed suffering, heard it. I have resonated with suffering. Now I want to resolve suffering. And it makes it so that my whole mental space is filled with suffering. My whole mental psychological horizon is just suffering. And when we fall into that state, what it does, it activates in my brain two areas. I mean, it's called the insula and the cingulate cortex. These two areas are the areas of, that uh, are responsible for my suffering. So I end up triggering in my own brain the areas responsible for suffering and I ache. I physically ache for that person and I fall in, into something called empathic distress and it will lead to my own collapse. So not good. So what would be a better way to be able to be there for people but without putting ourselves at risk? So let's look at it. It starts just like the other path. So the person calls, I can observe the suffering and I will experience empathy. I fully feel the empathy with the, the person, but it's at the third step uh, that I totally change strategy. Instead of telling myself, I have to alleviate that suffering. It's horrible. I have to alleviate the suffering. I switch gears. And what I'm telling myself is what kind of comfort or well being can I offer here and now? So I'm no longer focused on the person's suffering. I'm now totally focused on the kind of um, comfort, well being I can give. And so my mental space suddenly is no longer filled with suffering, overwhelmed with suffering. It's suddenly filled with compassion and the, um, with a sense of deep gratification. I really want to give to that person. And what it does, it activates in my brain very specific centers 
associated again with deep gratification and in turn it makes me experience some quiet inner strength there's really a sense of peace that settles and i feel useful i feel genuinely connected to others and i'm going to be resilient and so the key difference as you can see and by the way i will send you all these slides if you want to uh, to um, have them afterwards. So the key issue is once I've resonated with the suffering, not to really kind of be absorbed by it, but just step back and say, what can I do? What kind of kindness can I offer? And it sounds, sounds like something totally banal, but it really changes the whole brain response. And what research has really uh, taught us and again it's brand new research um it's um it's been published in the past year or so and i've got it here i mean the neuroscience of empathy compassion and self-compassion and a lot of uh different uh books on neuroscience and what they they teach us is that the strongest posture we can adopt psychologically as human beings is the posture of compassion and self-compassion and the image i've put there is a roly-poly and um, a roly-poly is one of those dolls you know you can just smack them on the head they will go bang on the floor and they will oscillate quite a bit but they will always come back to their center no matter how, how hard you smack the thing it will oscillate and come back to its center and it comes back to its center because at the very bottom right here there's lead so there's really it's weighed down and it makes it so that the center of gravity um, always come back always comes back to where it, it should and the analogy i want to um, to bring is that in humans what really brings us back to our cent psychological center of gravity is compassion the lead that allows us to you know bounce back and despite all the oscillating to come back to our posture of strength is compassion and um, there's a whole lot of research being done on compassion i don't have time to cover it today but it's very clear that when we are in distress if we can really move into a space of first self-compassion and then compassion to others that's what's going to bring us back to a sense of well-being and i'm coming back to the manager i was telling you uh, about earlier who's been working for 28 days no rest whatsoever 16 hours a day I asked her, I said, you know, can you name something that's really helped you to, um, to be resilient, to still be there? And you know what she told me? She said um, on Sunday, because it was Mother's Day, she went out and bought roses for um, the mothers on her staff, the mothers who couldn't be at home. And she said that, <coughs> excuse me, when she actually distributed the roses, this was the event that helped her regain her balance she really put herself in that posture of compassion and managed to bounce back and so the central question is always what kind of comfort of well-being can i offer and if we do that suffering and distress no longer drag us down we feel genuinely connected to others and our sense of isolation will fade away we know also that in times of crisis um, we all experience a sense of helplessness and acting taking action is a powerful antidote to anxiety and again in a situation where we cannot you know change the system we cannot change covid the question will be what is it i can change what can i act upon and so what I wanted to suggest to you is a strategy called 
called micro resolutions. So what's a micro resolution to step back? It's like a resolution, but we all know that the new year's resolution, we usually give up within about three weeks. When the time February comes around, we've abandoned our resolutions because they're way too grand and vague and often they're phrased in in terms of what we would like to be oh i'd like to be more patient i'd like to be better organized this is too vague and it's nearly impossible we don't know how to to um you know grab the thing and when we keep things that vague it's um it requires the brain to constantly make decisions and the brain falls into decision fatigue and even eventually gives up entirely. So micro resolutions are designed to solicit the reflex centers of the brain rather than the decision making areas. Nobody here this morning really pondered for a long time, how am I going to brush my teeth today? It's a reflex. And that's what you want a micro resolution to be. And I give you an example of a micro resolution in my life. Initially, I would say, I want to be better organized. I got nowhere. So the question was to ask myself, what is the behavior in my life around organization that irritates me the most? And quickly, I identified it was the fact that I was always searching for my keys. So I thought, fine, I'm going to tackle that first. And so the, what I decided to do and we'll look at how the micro resolutions work. So it's got to be easy, literally a no brainer. So my micro resolution, find my keys. Couldn't be any simpler than that. It's got to be explicit and measurable. Yeah, how often I do find my keys. <laughs> so I, I have to be able to um, measure that um, it's working. It's got to pay off upfront. So when the micro resolution works, there's a real sense of gratification. What I did here, I simply put a hook on the door frame when I come in. So I come through the door, put the keys on the hook. So it's a no brainer, explicit, and it pays off every time I find the darn keys. They're always on the hook. The It's personal. Nobody could have told me that um, the, the that it was the, the behavior I wanted to change. I needed to identify it myself. It resonates positively. If I had told myself, geez, you know, I'm going to damage the door frame, how terrible, uh, would have been a bad start. If I say, well, I'm going to find my keys every time I go out. So it really resonates positively. It fires on cue. I come in, I put it on, I go out, pick them up. And we make only two micro resolutions at a given time. Again, in terms of neuroscience, it, um, our brain cannot tackle more than two changes at once. But on the bright side, we know that to fully embed neurologically a micro resolution, it takes about three weeks. So we can take one and kind of um, develop, develop it into a habit over about three weeks time and then we can move on to a next one so in these times of covid and to bounce back what could we do i mean what we know the strongest thing the best strategy is to keep a compassionate stance to make sure that even in daily life we are remain aware of people around us and that our our spontaneous tendency becomes, hey, what, what can I do for people? But we can also add to that one micro resolution to strengthen our resilience. And so even just right now, this morning, you can decide, do you want to adopt a new definition of resilience that allows for being destabilized and bouncing back? Do you want to protect your sleep? Let's say, you know, from today, you don't drink coffee after um, afternoon or you put some kind of alarm an hour before you go to bed to make sure that you get off screens before uh, going to sleep. 
Um, do you want to limit your screen time and again have activities that feed the soul like gardening and cooking and being more creative? Do you want to embrace one unpleasant emotion twice a week with the RAIN guidelines saying, well, you know, from now on I give myself a strategy to deal with the stuff I don't really like. Um, do you want to do a bit of cleaning up when you feel tense or out of sorts? Um, do you want to switch your inner speech from suffering to comfort and kindness when people around you suffer? As you can see, even in the brief time we've had together, you've got a broad range of choices uh, to choose from to act on something in your daily life. And I wanted to end the session with the words of a scientist I deeply admire. His name is Hubert Reeves, and he's an astrophysicist who worked for years for NASA and for the Commissariat à l'énergie atomique de France. And he's about 85 now. And he's grown not only into a world-renowned uh, scient scientist, but also uh, into a man of great wisdom. And um, in his latest book, he uh, offers a reflection on the qualities that have best contributed to our species resilience. And he tells us, he says, the long path towards becoming human was lit by three bright lights. The desire to understand the world, science, the desire to make it more beautiful, art, and the desire to help sentient beings to live. And he says, three qualities to remember, to be curious, to be creative, and to be compassionate. And really, in these times of COVID, that's what I wish us all. Thank you. And so now I think we do have time for comments and questions. Yes. Um, any any questions, comments? Yes, Natalie. So you were talking about, um, amongst other things, rest, exercise, and diet. So one of the really neat ways, because I, I talk a lot about self-care and that type of thing, um, we talk about the red theory, which is rest, exercise, and diet. Yeah. So, and I really liked, uh, well, I mean, you're based on fact, but it was very interesting that the very first thing that you need is the sleep, so the rest, which when you do the acronym, because when you went through and then you talked about, they were really were in order, weren't they? Yep, yeah, absolutely. So that, that was pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a good point. I had never stopped to think about the red uh, acronym, but you're right, it's in the, the correct order, yeah. Any comments, questions? Hi, Rachel. Hi. My name is, yes, I, Sanjula here. I was just looking, you're talking about the micro resolutions. And you talked about not having coffee, like the people, like one of the res resolutions can be not having coffee at three o'clock. And then for the person who's habitual to drinking coffee, what about the anxiety management? Like they would be anxious, they would be jittery. How would they manage it? Actually, the, what research tells us is to go slowly. That radical. I so. Yeah. So uh, maybe you would have initially for a couple of weeks, you would have just three quarters of a cup of coffee. And then you move to half a cup of coffee and you gradually wean yourself off. Um, really radical. Changes like that can be difficult. And the thing about micro resolutions, they work because usually you experience uh, success and you build on that. It really gives you the energy to uh, tackle another one. And that's why it's really important not to do something that will shoot yourself in, in the foot and eventually. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's called, yes, that's called shaping of behavior gradually, like taking small steps towards the final end. Yeah, absolutely. and even if and even if fall back, it's not like a big fall. 
No, we have something to bank up on. Yeah, and it's it's what resilience is all about. I mean, we will fall. I mean, that's part of the that's part of the question is not around falling or not. It's about around bouncing back. I was just thinking with this the resilience thing, planning for failure also would be a, like a good step. When you take us action, take a step. What happens when I fail? So yeah. we don't go back in those doldrums. Exactly. Learning Thank from you. mistakes. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Well, uh, oh, that was most pleasant, Rachel. Thank you. Uh, um, thank you again for being with us. Uh, we've been, it's been a while since we have made several plans to get you back to New Brunswick, but uh, we managed to do it and you stayed home in Ottawa, which is just, just perfect. Thank you very much. You, you bring, uh, you bring uh, wings of uh, hope, courage, and well, compassion, if we could say it as well, which we always enjoy when you're, uh, when you're with us.